When I first played Dead Space in 2008, it wasn't necessarily the horror elements that I fell in love with. That was cool, and it was certainly the initial draw of the game for me. But what really stuck with me and captured my imagination was the ship, the USG Ishimura. After receiving a distress call, engineers are sent to repair the ship, and you play as one of those engineers, Isaac. Equipped with cutting tools and the grip telekinesis module as well as stasis modules, you're tasked with bringing the ship back online and getting it in working order. Life support, hydroponics, power, all of these systems had different issues, different hazards, and different ways to fix them. The idea of being an engineer who has to fix a Planet Cracker class ship when so many various components can go wrong is awesome. And that was the big draw for me in Hard Space Shipbreaker. Equipped with Dead Space-like tools, you instead use them as they were intended, but not to repair ships, but to strip them for parts. It's such a great concept, diving into derelict ships to power them down, dismantle components, extract working machinery and fuel, and maybe even learn the history of what went wrong or why the ship is being decommissioned. That as a premise, to me, is just a brilliant idea, especially for these job simulator type games. It's like, yes, you're not fighting necromorphs around Aegis 7, but this is more in line with games like SnowRunner or Satisfactory, where you've got a job to do and there's a game built around it. It's what I often call a great podcast game. The game doesn't demand 100% of your attention all the time, but it's a great way to wind down and relax in the evenings while watching or listening to a stream, a video, or a podcast. Unfortunately, that concept I described isn't fully realized here. The game is quite good, its core loop is really strong. You're not just aimlessly carving up metal to throw it in some random bin. Instead, you are salvaging important components, you're depressurizing sections of the ship, removing reactor cores and avoiding leaks, be it fuel, coolant, or radiation. Make one mistake, and you could rip the ship apart or get yourself crushed between colliding plates of metal. Now, if that happens, it's not so much the life you've lost, but the ship you've damaged. That's the biggest concern. If computer systems or other intricate parts are cut, exposed to fires or harsh impacts, they lose their value and they're just tossed in the furnace. The drawback, unfortunately, is everything else. The career mode of the game sets up the story where you're a new recruit for a mega corporation named Lynx, and this company is clearly just written as a parody of the corporate environment. And at the beginning, it's funny. You have to sign terms and NDAs before working, and you start off with a debt of $1.2 billion. Every job you do chips away at this debt, but you're also paying for the rental of the equipment, your suit, refilling oxygen tanks, and so on. This was all fine. It was, you know, charming, a little tongue-in-cheek. It sort of served the purpose for why you were there. But then the game introduces you to a few characters, most notably Weaver, who sort of just acts as an advisor, Lou, who is another worker attempting to get a union off the ground, and Hal, a middle manager brought in who doesn't care about workers' rights, safety, or seemingly has any knowledge about the work. Now, the dialogue between these characters is really bad, and it just feels very, very forced. It almost comes across as written for children. Up until maybe a hundred years ago, workers like us would sometimes form these groups, called unions, and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the company. They'd argue for better wages, safer work, decent hours, that kind of thing. Lynx was actually part of getting rid of them but some of us are trying to bring it back. Hal is clearly meant to come across as an idiot, again, a sort of parody of this middle manager, but Lou is meant to come across as someone you sympathize with. She wants to unionize, she thinks she works harder than everyone else, and she randomly tells you a story about how she kissed a girl on some faraway job. Now, I've got no problem with any of those themes, but it's delivered in such an awkward way, and for no reason. You don't talk back, so it's like, why are you telling me this? I don't know why, but I've been feeling a bit lonely lately. Creeps up on me sometimes. Gets me thinking about this girl I knew back on the Ares platform. Bumped into her while climbing around the scrapyard. Wicked smart, that one. Cute, too. We ate falafel at a street vendor, then got ice cream. Her lips were cold and sweet when we kissed. I was too shy to go home with her. <laughs> she had fire in her. She left for a job out on the frontier. I'm not mad at her. I would have done the same thing. The weirdest thing is how they seemingly hate their job. Like, the game you're playing is the job, so hearing people complain about it so frequently is pretty stupid. I enjoy the job. It's fun. That's why I'm playing the game. Stop telling me how you want to leave and do something better than this. In SnowRunner, when I'm driving through the mountains, delivering logs to build bridges or get some factory back up and running, it's awesome. I really enjoy it. 
I don't want someone on my radio to say, Man, this fucking sucks, doesn't it? I can't wait to get out of here. It's like the narrative team weren't really aware of the parody that they created, and instead just created a really whiny, annoying character who took the joke seriously. The real shame here is that the story could have been pieced together through audio logs that you found in the ships, like finding logs of people planning to unionize and maybe uncovering a plot to take the company down through sabotage. Instead, you find audio logs, but they're disjointed, largely jokey and, to be quite frank, uninteresting. Did you know I went down the other day and I asked him to rustle me up some samosas? You know how much I love my samosas. There was real potential here to create a sort of black box recording of what went wrong with ships, be it crew in their final moments of battle, piracy boarding a ship, equipment failing, different space anomalies that they encountered on their journey. There was so much potential. What's worse is you can't even listen to the recordings while on the job. You have to listen to them back at the hab, which is just such a bizarre decision. A game that is largely silent during its gameplay. You can't listen to the many audio recordings that you pick up. Now switching away from the narrative and back to the gameplay, let's talk about the core loop, seeing as that is the best thing, and like I said, it is really good fun. When you begin a shift, you have a timer for 15 minutes to salvage the ship in the bay. How you approach it is completely up to you, and it can vary with the ship depending on its layout, its size, its complexity, and some random deviation for things like which rooms will be pressurized, which ones have power, and where certain components are placed. All the components a ship is made up of is categorized to either furnace, processing, or barge. Furnace is usually for raw materials to be melted down like steel frames or walls. Processing is for more complex materials like panels and piping. And the barge is for more intricate things like computers, switches, light fixtures, or anything that's seemingly made up of lots of little parts. Everything you hover over in the game will tell you where it has to go right below the crosshair, and often things need to be separated by pulling them off of each other. Your main tools to get the job done are a cutting tool, which can melt joints directly, or it can be used to slice across things in a very Dead Space-esque fashion by rotating either horizontally or vertically. Then you've got a grapple tool, which is used to push and pull things, and also to tether them together, or to pull really large objects towards the gates. Lastly, you then have demo charges. These are remote explosives that cut very strong metal. Now, metal actually has varying degrees of a cut grade, and your lasers can only do grade 1. Explosives can cut through anything higher than that. And this just felt kind of odd to me. All the tools just work for tier 1, and then explosives just work for everything else. Apparently during early access, there was supposed to be tools that would be utilized for cut grade 2, and for other things generally, but for whatever reason, these are all the tools in the game right now. In career mode, your tools get progressively improved over time as you spend LT points, which are earned for progressing past thresholds of your salvage. The more you successfully salvage, the more points you get to spend on upgrades, but you also earn XP that would allow you to work on bigger and more complex ships. It's a pretty satisfying core loop that always has you getting something new every couple of shifts, and since they only last 15 minutes each, the time really does fly. Now, you can always just do free play to get everything straight away and have no limits, and in that case, time actually will count up, so you can score on the leaderboards for how fast you salvaged a particular ship. There is also a nice side progression to the game where you'll be given your own ship, and off the record of the company, you can scrounge some materials back with you to fix it and improve it, which is an eventual requirement for leaving Link's company and finishing the story. You can pay off your debt, but in order to leave, nothing comes free, so you need to get your own ship up and running. This is a great little mini side progression where you can break the materials that you'd otherwise have got paid for in order to actually just get the raw materials from them to fix your own ship. And you can see what ships have before you start a shift so you know what to look for. Again, this core loop really is just the best part of the game. I'm constantly wanting to do one more shift because they really do feel like they go by very fast. As you rank up and ships get more complex, the game really does become much more interesting. You'll be introduced to reactors, which once removed out of their casing will begin to melt down and break the ship apart around them. Cut into them directly and you'll have a big explosion on your hands too. Then, as you progress along, you'll be certified to work on fuel tankers and pressurized ships. And this is where the physics, although a little bit wacky, becomes fully utilized, as you'll either use the onboard computers to depressurize or pressurize certain cabins, 
or if you've maybe ripped the computers off the walls already, you'll have to do a controlled depressurization by cutting a hole somewhere that won't get you killed or damage everything inside it. The same goes for fuel pipes. You need to be careful to avoid cutting the pipe directly or having some other hazard break it. This can cause explosions, but if the power is still on, you typically can just find a fuel flush switch that will drain the pipes and keep them safe. The challenge is in getting to the switch without damaging the ship and doing all of this against the clock. Eventually, the ships get bigger, the rewards get greater, and the complexity becomes more nuanced as you'll have to shut off a series of valves, pull fuses at the right time, and disconnect coolant systems to shut down volatile reactors. The game really starts to come into its own and begins to scratch that dead space itch ever so slightly, but that is kind of where it ends. A complaint that's often leveled at the game from its community is a lack of ships, and I agree. The game is definitely at its most fun when you're on the biggest and most complex ships, but even they are about 1% the size of something like a USG Ishimura. Now, of course, I wouldn't expect the game to have a ship on that scale, but the potential of this game is having still large-scale freighters that you could really walk around in that would have multiple floors, ships with real stories to tell. Those could even have artificial gravity systems and many, many different tools to work with. Even without my dreams of large-scale ships, it's a real shame that they didn't invest into some sort of ship editor so players could create ships and upload them to the workshop with the models already in the game. Again, just massively missed potential there that would have added great replay value. So for Hard Space Shipbreaker, I recommend it. It's a novel idea, but it leaves me wanting more. It seemed like a small side project for Blackbird Interactive, who also just made Crossfire Legion, and I'm sure they have their hands full now with Homeworld 3. But it's a shame that they couldn't maybe give this to an indie studio or dedicate a bit more time to it because it is made in Unity. And I'm sure there's a lot more that could be done with it. For some reason, even though I do enjoy the game, all I can see with it is lost potential. The game is available on Steam and also PC Game Pass, which is where I played it. And if you're subscribed to that service, this is a perfect sort of double-A game to play on there. Listen to a podcast, carve up some ships, clear your debt, and I guess be done with it. Thank you very much for watching, let me know what you think of the game, and if you agree with my take on the potential for something like this, can Dead Space work without the action? I think it can. That's all from me, and I'll see you in the next one. Rustle me up some samosas. You know how much I love my samosas.